situation here. So farmers totally dependent on rain, making lives unpredictable, extensive uses of diesel-based pumps and for irrigation, which is not required. 30% goes into waste. 30% of our produce actually <coughs> goes to waste because of lack of power and lack of uh, storage capacity. High usage of solid fuels for kerosene and cooking, co for cooking, adding to the global warming and deforestation. Poor quality health care, as I talked about this. High child mortality, infectious diseases, lack of cold chain for vaccines. We don't have enough cold chains for keeping vaccines in this country, which means a lot of vaccines get spoiled before they get to the people. And if you can even preserve these vaccines properly, a lot of children are vaccinated, but they're not immunized. And that's a real problem in this country, unfortunately. Lack of wastewater treatment. And on this little children get only a few hours for students uh, of power, which is limiting their ability to compete with city peers, and it's permanently relegated to a second tier standing. So there's a lot of children who don't have power, have only intermittent power. You're already, already condemning them to a second tier status because they're not competing with children who have power all through, all through the day, for example. So they are starting off at the position of an unequal start, unfortunately, or, or compromised start. So India has the fifth largest power generation capacity in the world, but its demand is growing very rapidly. Our demand is growing with 7.5%, so 9,608,000 nine, uh, 9, gigawatt hour in you know, fiscal year 12, to now uh, up to uh, much, much greater, 19 million, oh sorry, 13 million gigawatt hours in, in, in fiscal 17. And our power generation still remains very thermal, as you know, which is causing a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Most of our power is thermal, and uh, we're looking at thermal sources of coal, 54%, gas 10%, diesel 1%, hydro is 21 which is renewable, and we need to get away from these thermal power sources completely, because they are not only polluting, they are also creating greenhouse gas emissions, actually. And renewables need to go further. We need to do a lot of work on renewables and clean, clean power. And if you look at, in fact, where the other countries are, we don't appear anywhere in number one. So if you look at that number one slot, which is renewable power, China is ahead of us. China is far ahead in renewable power right now. China has got very close, at the highest installed capacity of renewable power, which is solar, wind, and tidal, is actually in China right now. It's not in the United States. If you look at renewable power, um, um, I mean, in, in terms of all of these things, biopower, United States, geothermal, United States, Hydropower China, hydropower generation is in China, wind power is in China. You can, you can see that China appears in fact a number of these first spots now in terms of renewable and clean tech when it comes to energy production. And India unfortunately does not appear and I think we have a lot to do. So we have this sort of renewable superpower vision we talk about in this country. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done and I believe that's where the research between university and industry can help. I really believe that you can de develop a better uh, power sources such as renewable energy share, alternative fuels and biofuels, energy recovery, solar water heating systems, cogeneration, and, and remote unelectrified villages. So I think you have a huge opportunity for renewable uh, power in this country, and we need, we certainly have a long way to go, I think, when it comes to getting our dependence off of this thermal power that we produce and take it into renewable power. So those are the research areas. I want to very briefly talk about how we actually take these research findings that have come out of these projects into actual communities. And here we depend on our industries. So whatever we are developing in terms of technologies, new technologies, we want to take these technologies to the industry and say, well, here are the technologies go forward and actually apply that. And that's a sustainable model, because universities don't know how to apply technologies. It's the companies that know how to apply technologies, and we want industries to actually take these technologies forward. So I want to give you some examples of, of the work that we have done. So there is a Tondebhavi small town in Karnataka, just one hour from Bangalore. It's a population of 900 million, and we built a road, a rural road, in that little town with three new technologies. Don't forget, we are not a charity, so we are not building roads that an NGO would build. So we build this road with three new technologies in this small village, 
And why are we interested in this small village? For a very simple reason. 46% of roads in India remain unpaved right now. And if you look at the rural development or rural roads in this country, we need very close to 2.4 million kilometers of rural roads in this country. 2.4 million kilometers of rural roads are needed in this country. So if I can actually start with a process or a project where I'm able to actually bring new technologies into the small town of building roads, I think I can take this to a much bigger objective of building 2.4 million kilometers of rural roads in this country. So what we have done is we have gone to this village and we have built this road. So this on top is the village before the road was built. At the bottom you're looking at the road that's been built. And what have we done which is new? Typically, your rural roads are 300 millimeters deep. What we have done with high performance concrete, high fiber reinforced concrete, we have been able to reduce the thickness of these roads by 66%. What that means is we are now building roads which are only one third the, the thickness because of high strength materials, because of fiber reinforcement, and those kinds of things. And look at, I mean, this has got these three different, it's a sort of a ring road pattern. And what we are looking at right now is a, a project which consumed less than 50% of the material which would have been consumed otherwise if we had built it according to Indian Road Congress requirements. And that's wonderful because now I'm saving the material, I'm saving the actual footprint of this system, and I'm pretty sure this road will last three times longer than any of the roads that last in our rural community today. And here is an opportunity now, and as I said, I mean, this is not a charity. We are really doing this to promote a new technology into the rural context, actually. We are not stopping there. We are also harvesting water from this particular pavement. We tested water in this small town. And every source of water that we tested in this small town tested positive for E. coli. Every single source, every single tap water that we tested in this village actually tested for E. coli. And it actually makes you cry when you see these small children drinking water that is actually infected with E. coli. You are actually preparing them for a major health disaster coming forward. So what we are doing is we are actually harvesting water from this, for, from this pavement, taking it to an ultrafiltration unit which is developed by IC Impacts, and supplying the water to the school. So these units which can supply up to 600 liters of water a day, these are simple units, don't require much of a power, and they're cleaned actually through gravity, and we're supplying that water coming from the pavement straight into a school of about 600 liters a day, which is sufficient for this school right now. Perfect. So that's, that's the sort of project we're looking at. And we're taking these things also to uh, Canada. So we're building this similar road in a small community north of Edmonton. But there, we are looking at actually recycled tire into the pavement. And as, don't forget, we're producing, we're producing uh, almost a billion tires a, a year in the world. Only 14% of that actually gets put back into use. 84% or 86% of that actually goes into landfill. And if you can actually recycle all these tires back into infrastructure, I think it's a huge opportunity. So what we're doing is we're developing processes where we can convert these these tires into straight polyester and nylon rayon fiber, which goes in as a fiber reinforcement into concrete right now. So we have developed that technology through the center, and it's actually going into this particular pavement project. Another project we're doing is, is uh, strengthening the KRS Dam. This is the Krishna Raj Sagar Dam, which was built by uh, our great engineer uh, Visveswarya, and with his name, uh, we have this wonderful institute here, VNIT. So this was the one he designed this particular bridge, uh, this particular dam, and it's in big, uh, you know, there's some major issues with this. So we are actually in the uh, repairing this with those materials that were used back in 1930s, so that this bridge, this dam should look exactly how it was built back then. We don't want it to look like a dam that was built today. So this is what we call heritage conservation using the same old material. We have on the water treatment side, we have this mobile treatment unit. So this one, which is actually IC Impact's uh, um, developed truck, this goes from village to village to village to purify water. Now you never require a, a permanent water treatment system in any of these villages. And I'll tell you something. There's so much 
of this RO capacity that's being introduced in those villages, I believe it's a waste of money. I really believe it's a waste of money. It is producing huge amount of uh, wastewater, and it's actually most of the water in this country does not require RO treatment. They're actually taking very good minerals out of this water as a result of this massive, uh, you know, uh, treatment by which you're actually removing a lot of good minerals as well. You don't require RO in many cases. Of course, you need to need to test the water. And so this one actually depends completely on either a vacuum ultraviolet filtering or it depends on ultrafiltration using membrane technique, and which are quick methods, and they don't take all the minerals out, and we, we can go from village to village to village. You can purify the water right there on spot, give them whatever 600 or 800 liters of water that they need, and the truck then moves on to the next village to purify the water elsewhere. And we are doing this actually in a circuit of about 12 villages right now in British Columbia, where I think this water is being, being purified. And it's a great model, I think, for India as well, actually. So, any entrepreneurs in, in the village, uh, in the in the audience, think about a water treatment facility which is mobile, and it's a great opportunity. So, finally, we are at the Ganga River Action Plan. We are working with them on zero discharge or liquid discharge technologies for pulp and paper, textile, agriculture, tanneries, and other polluting industries. As I said, 20% of the discharge into the river actually is from industries. 80% is just raw sewage from domestic uh, sources. So what we are doing, and you know, we don't need any research to understand how to treat sewage. We know how to do all that. I think what you really require technologies is for these industries which are pollute, which are just discharging affluents, completely untreated, completely untreated. I've been to one of the tanneries in Kanpur, and I was astonished actually that this water that's come, this affluent that's just coming out of the tanneries which has hexavalent chromium in it. This has hexavalent, I don't know how many have, have watched that movie, Erin Brockovich, remember where she was actually you know, going after this Grace uh, Corporation because they were discharging hexavalent chromium into the river and where children were actually you know, getting cancer and being born deformed. We're doing this in this country today, unfortunately. And I saw this little girl drink water which had come out of the tannery and I said to myself, this needs to stop. I mean, this girl is actually going to have cancer by the time she's 18. And that's an inexcusable, inexcusable way we operate in this country. So we're looking at these zero discharge technologies, which means the tanneries water, pulp and paper water, or from uh, textiles, must be treated on site, which means that you cannot discharge a single drop of polluted water into any of the natural streams that belong to people. And that's really we need to actually work on that. Finally, I want to talk about the smart city concept. How am I doing time by okay. yeah. So, I know there's a lot of interest through, you know, uh, Nagpur First and Global Nagpur in terms of this smart city concept. And I want to talk a little bit about the work we're doing in that particular sphere. So, it's a digital world out there now. And I know India is a leader in many, many things when it comes to IT, ICT platforms, digitalization and things like those, and we are actually very good at that. So innovation is driven by consumer, of course, and you have a whole bunch of digital innovation in healthcare, you have the health monitors, smart homes, 3D printing, you know, the room rentals, of course, you know, Airbnb, which doesn't own a single hotel room, is now a $40 billion company. That's, that's the power of on-demand technology. If you look at Uber, Uber, which is now valued at about $55 billion, doesn't own a single taxi. It doesn't own a single taxi. But you're all using Uber because it has created a platform for you. And that's the sort of power, I think, of on-demand uh, technologies. Telecom, media, TV on demand, you know, these sort of uh, driverless cars that Google is talking about these days, it's all, in fact, a digital a digital imprint on our lives. And, and it has also changed a lot of things in research. So if you look at physical sciences, life sciences, mathematical and statistical sciences, social and business sciences, we're using computer science in everything now. Computer science is actually changing everything in terms of even how we do research now. You know, in terms of materials processing, molecular modeling, it's all, you know, computer-based modeling of our processes now. So you look at, 
you know, human-centric systems, decision sciences, computational biology. You know, when you did in the old days any psychological research, you know, you were dealing with 10 subjects or maybe 15 subjects. Now, with the digital world, you can deal with 3 million subjects and come up with your actual, uh, you know, sort of the analysis and actually conclusions from your psychological analysis of people or social sciences type human, you know, behavior, for example. So that's what's happening a great deal now that's changing everything that we do out there. So in a smart city concept, I believe we are not doing enough on infrastructure to bring this digital revolution in. So when you design you know, what a smart city is, and this is a definition that was, I was given by the Ministry of Urban Development as to what really a smart city is, it's institutional infrastructure, which is efficient, accountable, and transparent planning, et cetera. You're looking at uh, you know, e-governance and those kinds of things. There's social infrastructure in terms of education, healthcare, and entertainment. There's economic infrastructure, which is in cities' ability to generate economic activities by creating employment and attracting investments. But tucked away in here, I think which is something I want to talk about, is the physical infrastructure and how we can actually take, make use of these digital technologies to make our bridges better, to make our power structure better, to make our water treatment facilities better. And that's the idea, I think, of, for me, of a smart city, that we can make these things far more efficient in terms of being able to actually create that smart city concept that we're talking about. So here is the blueprint of where we want to go, and in fact, we're doing some of it already here, in, sorry, in Vancouver. So in the, in the center, what you have is a command uh, room or a control room, which is actually monitoring a lot of things at the same time. So you have the housing that's being monitored. These are smart homes. You can monitor power consumption. You can monitor energy performance. You can monitor indoor quality. You can monitor acoustics, lighting. You can monitor a lot of things in a, small, in a, in a building so that you become you bring sort of the conservation, water, energy, comfort, acoustics, all kinds of different things that you could monitor. You can monitor waste management, civil infrastructure, you can monitor water, sanitation, transport, and energy, all in a city centrally. What that means is you get this synergy of being able to monitor things so effectively now that your waste becomes minimized and your efficiency becomes maximized. And I think that's the way to look at a smart city where you're actually aware of what's going on in the city, not in a sort of a, you know, in a, in a kind of disconnected fashion, but in a very connected fashion. So let me tell you a little bit about the monitoring that we are doing, which actually applies more to structures of, of, of infrastructure, basically. So in a structural health monitoring, what we do is, there's a typical bridge, and this is one we're monitoring in Dubai right now, it's a sensor that you place on a structure. It actually inter interacts over the internet with the actual engineer who's monitoring this particular bridge. You do sensing, you would do data acquisition, you would do data processing, communicate this, you do damage detection, you do modeling and interpretation. And the same concept can apply to water treatment, same concept can apply to aviation, same concept could apply to transportation. Intelligent transportation systems is just that where you're monitoring city traffic in an intelligent way. I think uh, Nagpur could definitely use a lot of intelligent transportation planning happening because you should really, I mean, you do have facilities, but it's just that it's not being planned properly. And I think there's a way of actually, you could be monitoring in, in intelligently the transportation system in the city, which means that you can come up with very efficient solutions so there's no traffic jams. You do have capacity of creating that problem. So here are some of the structures we're monitoring. So this is, in fact, the Confederation Bridge. This is the 14-kilometer long bridge. It has got approximately uh, 1,800 sensors on it right now. And we're monitoring every movement on this bridge right now. And, well, it started off as, in fact, we had used some new methods. There were new concretes being used. There were new types of steels being used in this bridge. There's some fiber reinforced composites used. So we wanted to, wanted to monitor how this new technology is performing. So we have about 1,800 sensors on this, and it actually is telling you where those sensor locations are right now. And this can be looked. I mean, I can give you the URL, and you can actually go and see for yourself what those 1,800 sensors are actually telling you right now. I can tell you exactly the number of cars on that bridge right now. I can tell you which car is carrying an excess load that, that you're not allowed on the bridge. And I can think about that, that, you know, if you, 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 if you, if you have a 25-ton requirement on a bridge and if somebody's carrying 34 tons, 
sensor will tell me right away that this bridge has got a vehicle at this particular location which is carrying more load than that's allowed on the bridge or beyond the beyond the regulation one. So the next project we are monitoring right now is a, is, is a, is a nuclear power plant. This is a decommissioned nuclear power plant, uh, not just, uh, just outside of Montreal. And it still has a lot of spent fuel in it. So it's still got a lot of radiation uh, possibilities. It's got some of the nuclear fuel inside. And we are monitoring, if you see that ring girder there, over there, we got some sensors which are monitoring any radiation leakage coming out of the, of the, of the structure. And we are very concerned about that because this is not too far from a, you know, a population of, of, of about three and a half million people. So we are monitoring basically the, uh, any leakage of nuclear radiation that can come out of this particular plant in terms of structural damage. Uh, this is another bridge we're monitoring. This has got about another 350 sensors on this, just not too far from where I am, very close to Vancouver. And here is what I'd like to suggest to you. I think you have this wonderful bridge called Ram Jula, and I believe that we can actually provide you with sensors, and we can provide you with proper technologies, data acquisition modules, routers, etc., from the center to monitor this specific grid. So I have actually got a, a design uh, of you know where exactly we would place the sensors on this particular bridge. So uh, that is something I think we started, and in, I know um, Bobby and I started talking about this some time ago, ago, but I don't give up that easily, Bobby. So there's still an opportunity, I think. We have the we have an opportunity to uh, place sensors and monitor this bridge for a number of uh, you know uh, things. And if there are other projects actually in this region that we could actually be monitoring of critical quality, could be water monitoring, could be wastewater monitoring, it could be industrial pollution monitoring, air monitoring, or air pollution monitoring. We could actually do these kinds of things as well. So this is a water sensing that we're doing in, in Canada right now. It's in Thorsby. Uh, and th th they have a brand new water treatment facility, but it's actually producing a water which has taste. So by the its water is fine when it's actually treated. But the moment it gets home, people can actually smell and, and, and have a bad taste in the water that's actually coming out of the plant. So somewhere in the distribution network there is a problem. So we have got these water sensors in there and we're monitoring really where that typical problem may, may arise. So those are the kind of s sensing projects which takes us into a smart um, city kind of domain. I want to... Uh, Finally, I think talk about an invitation to you all. There, there are, in fact, projects that we have uh, funding for right now. So there are three new calls for proposals that have just come out. IC Impacts has a call for demonstration projects. So I don't know how many of you are from the, from the university here, but there's definitely an op uh, opportunity here to get some funding for a demonstration project based on some of the technologies that can be jointly developed between IC impacts institutions in Canada and an Indian institution here, such as VNIT or, or LIT, I don't know. Uh, so that opportunity exists. So within that, we can also fund, in fact, a, a bridge monitoring or water monitoring type project here. Department of Science and Technology and IC impacts, uh, DST from, uh, from India, we've just launched a new call for smart and green buildings and sustainable cities, or smart cities, if you will. So again, that's a, that's a million dollar call right now. So we have funding now for joint projects with India through Department of Science and Technology. And finally, with DBT, we have just launched a call. This is again DBT India, Department of Biotechnology. We're looking at portable diagnostics and analyzers. So simple, tech, portable medical devices that can do quick detection of infections. We're looking at that as well, and that's a new call that's just come out. So from uh, industry, from academic institutions, I invite you. Uh, there are fellowships available as well for the center. If there are some students in the audience who want to visit the center, we can certainly provide funds for you to come and visit us, spend a little bit of time in the laboratory, and come back with those technologies and make a difference in this country. And that's the type of um, driven um, students that we want, both from undergraduate and the graduate area. I've taken enough of you for your time. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.
have the money to go about development because US economy is 17 trillion dollars, debt on the books is 19 trillion dollars. Chinese economy is you know 10 trillion dollars, debt may be much higher or little bit lower. Indian economy is 1.7, 1.8 trillion dollars, debt on the books is 70 percent. You know, are we doing all this to just fund interest portion for the global economies? And how can, how much we'll be trying, you know, keep trying to do all this research and new initiatives by not creating money but by printing money? Because you belong to, you know, the most developed countries. So I, I thought, let me ask this question to you. better now? Uh, okay. I think the, the answer to your second question is in, is in efficient systems. We still have to live, we still have to eat, we still have to drink. We still have to use the infrastructure. What that means is at the moment we are wasting a lot of resources in actually working with these systems which actually are not very efficient. Just take a guess on how much extra material is being used in this building because we don't know how, w our designs are very uncertain. A building like this actually utilizes more than 30% extra material because our designs have a huge amount of uncertainty in them. So if you sense the building, if I had sensors in this building, for example, the next building I design will have a much better understanding of what the actual loads are than what we are assuming them to be, right? So the idea is in ineff efficiencies. I think we, we, we still require these facilities, we'll still require the infrastructure. But what we are doing is actually we are not actually investing in proper efficiencies in these infrastructure and these kind of processes which will allow us to actually become a lot more or get more out of this material or, or get more out, uh, uh, reduce our carbon footprint at the same time and get more um, out of the materials that we utilize today, for example. Look at the recycling we do. The actual recycling rates in the world are less than 7%. And I believe that's completely inexcusable. All of these materials could be recycled back. See, nature never wastes anything. Nature recycles practically everything. So we need to learn from that, I think, and, you know, that if you have these kind of issues with respect to our, you know, global debt or, you know, the, the U.S. debt, which as I know is greater than its GDP, I guess the only way out of that is actually doing, making our systems far more efficient. Coming to your first question, which is more to do with smart cities. I, for one, believe that smart cities cannot exist in isolation ever. You have this massive urbanization in this world, in, in this co country particularly. What we are expecting is by 2035 or something, you would have almost close to 800 million people that are living in cities in this in, in this country. So there's this massive movement of people from you know uh, rural centers going into urban centers. You have to somehow stem that tide. And why are they moving? That's because we haven't we have ignored global or uh, uh, rural development in this country. So if you build these rural infrastructure, if you provide them with power, if you provide them with you know uh, proper uh, water they would, and proper economic activity, of course there would be a lot less incentive for people from the villages to come into, come into large towns. So every smart city, I believe, is a conglomerate of a city in the center with highly efficient and smart villages in its, in its vicinity. And that's a system we're talking about. 